the country is great because of the contributions of so many different types of people. We're all familiar with the names Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks, and most of us learned at least the basics of the civil rights movement in the 1960s. But there was a treasure trove of little known black history right here in San Antonio. In our history books, it didn't tell you about all the wonderful things that black people did. It talked to you about enslavement, and it talked to you about the fact that black people are typically good at sports. Well, you know, there's a lot more to African-American and Hispanic American history than just those two things. Historians are people, and they have their own biases, so what you have on paper may not necessarily be fact. From the arrival of the Canary Islanders in what is now San Antonio, to the woman who helped establish a historically black college on the east side, the success stories are hidden right in plain sight. What I've learned is when students do not see themselves in the curriculum, they are not engaged. If you're not teaching the importance um, of African-American contributions, Hispanic contributions as well, women contributions as well, to the general audience of public school students and university students, then you're not giving them uh, a range uh, of dignity that should be afforded to all of humanity. We're taking a look at some of the most fascinating and little known pieces of San Antonio's black history, the importance of shining a light on that, and how the Black Lives Matter movement plays into the long fight for equality. KSAT explains. KSAT explains. KSAT explains. KSAT explains. On demand, in depth perspective. Perspective on stories we bring you in our newscast throughout the day. We're looking into concerns over voting safety during a pandemic and the battle over mail-in voting. A look at how the protests and demonstrations have played out in our city and an examination of what it means to be black in San Antonio. An issue that you have likely felt the effects of, rising property taxes. The roots of Tejano run deep in South Texas. We examine the cultural impact the music has had in San Antonio. Our city's more than 300 year history is filled with people and moments that have helped bring us to where we are today. But for a long time, much of that history has not been taught. Thanks for joining us for this episode of KSAT Explains. I'm Myra Arthur. San Antonio was a city steeped in history, from the missions to the Majestic Theater to Samuel Maverick to Henry Cisneros. There are so many people, places and events that have gotten us to where we are today. But for years, so much of our city's black history has gone untold. In this episode, we take a look at those elements of our past and explain why they're so important, no matter your background and how they could influence our future. But first, Devin Clark takes a look at San Antonio black history and the stories that you may not know. Black San Antonians may only make up about 7% of our city's population today, but local historian, activist, and former city councilman, Mario Marcel Silas, says African-American roots can be traced back to the inception of the city when it was inhabited by Canary Islanders. People who came from the Canary Islands, who founded, and I'll put that in quotes because Native Americans were here first, but who founded the city of San Antonio, or the province of San Antonio, uh, from the Canary Islands were, gosh, more than a third black. The Canary Islands are off the west coast of Africa and were colonized by the Spaniards. Salas says today details of the island's original African history are often suppressed. When you have a society that teaches things only from a Eurocentric point of view, or only from a white supremacist point of view, you're going to have people simply erased from the history books. But Salas says his research proves black people consistently played undeniably crucial roles in local and state history. For example, there's the story of Samuel McCulloch. McCulloch, a free black man, was the first person wounded fighting for Texas in the Texas Revolution on October 9, 1835. According to the Texas State Historical Association, his role would later grant him pardons and rights that were denied to other blacks. Also during the Texas Revolution, black soldiers who had come from Africa to Cuba, then Mexico, fought in General Santa Ana's Mexican army during the Battle of the Alamo in 1836. This was the main body of troops who fought the Alamo defenders. And they were more, more than happy to do so because the Alamo defenders supported slavery and they did not. During wartime and after, black San Antonians helped shape the city we know today. 
much of the resilience guided by faith. For more than a century now, the Mount Zion First Baptist Church, which today is located on Martin Luther King Drive, has served the San Antonio community. The church was founded back in 1871 uh, by five uh, former slaves and a white minister. Mount Zion Church was initially a modest one-room building located on Santo Street. The church was there for a long time until 1924 uh, when they marched from Santo Street to this current location and they built this church. And today, Mount Zion is one of many historic black churches still standing here in San Antonio. Most people have heard of St. Philip's College, but did you know that it was founded back in 1898 as St. Philip's Normal and Industrial School with the intent of educating and training recently emancipated slaves? Artemisia Bowden joined the school as an administrator in 1902. Under her leadership, the institution eventually became a junior college. Local black sports history is also rich and again, birthed out of the need to persevere against racism. Because blacks could not play on white teams at first, Pittman Sullivan Park here on Iowa Street was where South Texas Negro League teams, such as the San Antonio Yankees, practiced and played. Nelson Swain, who played third baseman for the team starting back in 1964, recently reflected on what it was like. We didn't have the, the beautiful grass and the smooth uh, surfaces to play on and everything. But underprivileged black baseball players from San Antonio did have camaraderie and sportsmanship, which yielded toughness they needed to persevere and play against white teams that had better resources. And they would cheat and they would do yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. And we would just come together and that's what made us strong. Yeah, and right. they, we would just come together and we would just beat them with our bats. We, just, yeah, <laughs> we yeah. would just beat them up. <laughs> That can-do and winning attitude also reflected in local politics. In 2014, Ivy Taylor became the first African-American and only second woman to be elected as mayor of San Antonio. Ivy, Ivy. History shows that for blacks, having to break through barriers is normal. Today, what's considered one of the country's largest MLK Day marches brings thousands to San Antonio's east side. The demonstration honors the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s fight for civil rights. What's today? That march, like other demonstrations we saw throughout San Antonio's downtown last summer, following the death of George Floyd, represents the ongoing fight to end nationwide racial inequities in areas such as the criminal justice system, housing, access to resources, and education. Fair education is a top priority for Assistant Professor of Educational Leadership at Texas A&M San Antonio, Dr. Lauren Scott, and members of the nonprofit Community for Life Foundation. They petitioned the Texas State School Board to offer high school students the opportunity to take an African-American studies course as an elective. What I've learned is when students do not see themselves in the curriculum, they are not engaged. In April of 2020, the board unanimously approved the course as an elective for Texas schools. And some schools in our area, such as San Antonio ISD and Judson ISD, have already adopted the course in some of its schools. And here at Northeast ISD, we expect the course to be adopted in some schools this coming fall semester. The idea is making sure everyone understands what happened in the past that led up to the events of the present, so that history being created today and in the future will be brighter for all of us. Those efforts being made statewide to make sure that this little known history is unearthed is so important, not just for black San Antonians, but for our entire community. KSET producer Alexis Page explains why. There is so much history that we just don't know and we have been systematically kept away from. Um, you know, in our history books. That's a fact that most black people are aware of, but others may not realize. Tuesday night is the president and CEO of San Antonio for Growth on the East Side, or SAGE. She says the importance of knowing black history all comes down to representation. A lot of the mainstream media, a lot of movies, um, uh, art, no matter what it, it can be, you often don't see yourself portrayed in those. But the San Antonio African American Community Archive System, or SACAM, is working to change that in our city. We have to be mindful of the fact that this country is made up of many different ethnicities. And the country is great because of the contributions of so many different types of people. 
Another end of the spectrum is only hearing about the same Black historical icons. Um, as far as in the education system, the only thing that was taught was, you know, we learned about Harriet Tubman, we learned about Frederick, D Frederick Douglass, we learned about Martin Luther King. You know, beyond that, everything was obscure. Mario Salas remembers a student speaking up about this problem during a state board of education meeting. And I'm paraphrasing him, this is what he said. As much, as much as I love Martin Luther King, I'm tired of only hearing about him. We have many heroes, but yet they're not being discussed. It's a problem that affects everyone. If you're, if you're only talking about Martin Luther King as if there was no one else, then you're doing a disservice to the community. Most people know the history behind a handful of popular Black icons. George Washington Carver, Black scientist known for his inventions like peanut butter, Madam C.J. Walker, first female self-made millionaire, and of course, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., civil rights activist. But it's been more than 400 years since Black slaves came to America, and not enough of the stories from the past four centuries have been told. A lot of that history Unless you hear about it from family members or it's part of your culture, it's just unfortunately not depicted in our school books. And when students do learn about Black history, oftentimes it is sometimes in a negative light or further stereotypes placed on Black people. It talked to you about enslavement and it talked to you about the fact that Black people are typically good at sports. Well, you know, there's a lot more to African-American and Hispanic American history than just those two things. So why are so many people taught so little about the history of Black people's contributions to society? Salas says it's due to a rigged education system. So you get a population of people, uh, people of color, women included, um, who don't get to hear about their heroes. And when that takes place, you're creating a system that doesn't allow uh, for them to experience their own dignity. You're, you're teaching it from a white supremacist point of view or a Eurocentric point of view, and that's really problematic. It's not just problematic for Black people, it also affects other communities of color. I, you know, I've had students in various classes who've never heard of Cesar Chavez. You have to see representation, you have to see somebody that looks like you doing something. And if not, then you'll end up becoming one of the first, which we welcome too. The east side of San Antonio over the years has played an important role in our city's history and culture. It's become home to many in the local black community. RJ Marquez explains how that came to be. And it's a story that starts hundreds of years ago. Historians say that in the 1700s, many of the first Spanish settlers in San Antonio were from the Canary Islands and nearly a third were black. But they were not equals in the eyes of the Spaniards, and they were separated by racial lineage after settling in the area. The San Antonio River was the first line of segregation in, in the history of San Antonio. There was a clear boundary between white Spaniards who classified black people as lower class and associated them with slavery. If you were of dark skin, you were Native American, you were dark skinned Mexican, you had to live on the eastern side of the river. After the slavery period and during Reconstruction in the 1860s, Jim Crow segregation laws forced many black San Antonians to create their own communities. St. Paul Square became the epicenter of San Antonio's black community on the east side. Many historic east side churches like St. Paul Methodist and Mount Zion also became safe havens as racial tensions in the south remained high. The African American church was one of the few places in those early days where you could gather, you could obtain a measure of respect, you could learn. It was a safe space. After slavery is over um, and you look for leaders, it's the church that becomes that space that can bring people together. And so many of the leaders, the first political leaders, were honest, were, many of them were ministers or deacons because these are people that had the ability to read, people that had the ability to write, um, they were literate, they were in a position where they had the authority to speak. In the 1920s, the East Side saw significant growth during the Great Migration, when thousands of black people were driven from their homes by the lack of economic opportunities and harsh segregation laws in the rural South. San Antonio is part of that migration. Um, I would imagine that in this time period, the black population is increasing as blacks from the countryside outside of San Antonio, from places like Seguin um, and others are moving in. 
Mm -hmm. um, and as they move in, they're bringing their skills, their talents. During this time, San Antonio also became the second city in Texas to have an NAACP chapter. The chapter's influence along with the churches on the east side led to the birth of many prominent black community leaders, such as John Grumbles and Charles Bellinger, people who had political pull not only on the east side, but other parts of San Antonio. For African Americans, self-determination is important. These are self-made men and women. Mm -hmm. And so you find that they're buying up property. They're accumulating these assets um, and that the major black political leaders will kind of also be investors in the community and the community will recognize and respect them as investors in that community. San Antonio's history with the military also gave black leaders a voice. The defense industry pushed for a message of anti-racism and this gave an opportunity for many Eastside residents to speak out on civil rights issues. If you work for a white individual you may not want to be on the front lines, but if you were your own business leader, your business owner, you owned your own business, or you work with the military, these are going to be the people who will push for civil rights. And because the East Side community has that, it's got a foundation of leaders that can emerge. The East Side became a hub for the arts, religion, culture, and business. Despite a smaller black population compared to other Texas cities, San Antonio's black leaders were responsible for many accomplishments that have had a lasting impact. So really San Antonio is a place where it's happening. It's live, it's exciting, and maybe because of a little more leeway in race relations or leeway for African Americans to express themselves, it's a place where African Americans have some opportunity here. Now there is a balancing act of preserving what so many residents fought to build while also moving the east side into the future. In December of 2019, the east side of San Antonio was named the top 10 most gentrified cities in the United States. Um, and so it is seeing a lot of development, it's seeing a lot of movement, but unfortunately, some of that development does cause us to lose some of the history, some of the richness and the culture. San Antonio for Growth on the East Side wants to honor the East Side's history while also making sure new developments incorporate what residents need. And you, you, you see Redberry Mansion just opened up. Um, that is in the heart of the East Side. We have the Etsy, the East Side Education Training Center that's working on job force and workforce development. We've got St. Philip's College, the only HBCU on this side of the Mississippi and Hispanic serving institution. Then, you know, we've got all of our other partners that are really doing some great things. Velocity, Texas, that's coming to bring in STEM jobs and, and things. So the development is happening and we just need to make sure that we keep our finger on the pulse of all those things to make sure that it is uh, incorporated into the fabric of the community. When it comes to black history, we're living in a moment right now that the history books will likely remember the Black Lives Matter movement. It's been around for years, but it gained national focus and attention in the summer of 2020 after George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, a series of incidents in which black people were killed at the hands of law enforcement. There were marches and protests. Corporations got involved, showing their solidarity through ads or social media posts. So when we look back at this moment years from now, what role could the Black Lives Matter movement play in the larger civil rights story? I am the president of Black Freedom Factory. Camille Factory is a San Antonio activist, someone you may have seen on camera before when it comes to the local Black Lives Matter movement. It's natural and important that we observe that the fight is, is no different than the 60s, and that is basic human rights. We're talking about folk existing in violent structures uh, that we, you know, just continue, well, not we, that society continue to oppress communities of, of color uh, and vulnerable communities. So the, the dialogue is important because it's no different um, than it was in the past, and that's for people to have basic rights. While the message of equality is much the same, the origins of Black Lives Matter and the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s are different. Professor Kerry Lattimore wonders how that could impact how history remembers the movement. Black Lives Matter is really coming out of the more um, progressive Black Power, Black Panther Party, um, Republic of New Africa, and other kinds of movements that were a little more radical than some of the more traditional um, Southern Christian Leadership Conference and other movements 
that were really the foundation of the earlier civil rights movement. So I think that in the later civil rights movement, if we open that up to include Black Panther Party and others, then you can see the Black Lives Matters movement coming into part of that. Then there's the technology we have today that those who witnessed the civil rights movement couldn't even imagine. For the civil rights movement, we have journals, we have papers, we have all these newspaper clippings to tell this story, but a lot of the Black Lives Matter movement has happened on social media. Are people saving Instagram feeds? Are they saving Facebook pages? Are they downloading these videos? So while it's so strong in our memories right now, 10 years from now, what will we have for people to research these events in the future? We can only wait to see how history defines this moment. But those we spoke with who are living witnesses have hope that the struggle for equality, justice and equal opportunity will be the stories that prevail. It's a universal concept that everyone should be treated equally and fairly and that and that that premise of Black Lives Matter, I think, embodied that. And I think that the country needed it, it came at the right time. I hope history smiles at Black Lives Matter because that's simply what it encapsulates Black futures, it encapsulates Black children innovating in STEM and art and medicine. It means that we matter beyond a hashtag at the whim of violence. It means that our futures are just as bright and as promising as anyone else's. There are so many more hidden pieces of San Antonio's Black history. We encourage you to visit SACAM.org to dive into their online records and exhibits. That web address is here on your screen. The state of Texas, the last holdout after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, giving enslaved people their freedom. Our Jesse DeGuriato has been working on a series of stories exploring black history in San Antonio and Juneteenth. One of those stories takes us to a San Antonio museum that celebrates Juneteenth every day. At the heart of the San Antonio African-American Community Archive and Museum, the lesson and legacy of Juneteenth. Freedom is 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 not really freedom unless everybody's free. SACAM's Chief Administrative Officer Jeff May says Juneteenth is certainly a day to be celebrated. But to learn beyond Juneteenth should take you here to 218 Pressa. SACAM traces what led up to the day the enslaved people of Texas finally learned they'd been set free two years earlier by the Emancipation Proclamation. There's a timeline, artifacts, and much more. There is a place here that they can come and learn and explore and dive deep into the histories of African Americans in this region. Including those who would make their impact on San Antonio and Bear County. African Americans are black 365, and there's so much to us, there's so much to our history. Visitors, he says, can learn about a past they knew little about. And also they rediscover themselves when they come and take a look. SACAM is located here in historic La Villita, convenient to visitors and locals alike. We're open every single day and they can come and they can visit and we're free. As slavery at one time was very prevalent in San Antonio. In fact, records show that at times in our history, more than a quarter of the people living in San Antonio and Bear County were enslaved. The Bear County Clerk's Office has the records to prove all that. Now the clerk tells Jesse that her office is working to document it. So this one is in... Um, Before Lucy Adame Clark became Bear County event. Clerk. I didn't even know that slavery existed as much as it did in Bear County. A map shows nearly 30% of Bear County's population was enslaved, less than that of East Texas. But there was still a lot of people being sold here, and that's still an important thing to know. Slave over there as a the freedom exhibit so, that Raven Correa helped organize bears the proof, including bills of sale for human beings. I didn't realize some of the influential people that were buying slaves. One display shows the prominent Tejano, Jose Antonio Navarro, had as many as nine, likely for domestic work. They're mostly young women. Old handwritten records show so less than a handful of slaves were sold at a time. Some were so paid, but a portion of that sell. money went to their owners if they were shared among sell. other plantations. Historian Mario Salas believes the San Antonio area had 42 plantations at one time. Wherever there was a creek, there was a slave plantation. Next year, we're looking on looking for these plantations. They'll be cross-referencing the many maps and deed records in the Bear County Archive. So once everything's released and digitized, we are looking forward to see what else we can learn. 
Our final story is a profile of a newspaper that has been covering the African American community for years. The San Antonio Observer has been called the voice of the black community. Jesse sits down with the editor and his wife about the work they have done over the years to provide that voice. I'm Steve Spreester. Thanks for joining us. The front page cover stories grab your attention. Just exactly what the San Antonio Observer wants. You're not going to be heard unless you're loud in some way, shape, or form. Imagery is the hook, says its editor and publisher, Stephanie Zarello, and her husband, Wasim Ali. His father, the late Hussein Ali, started the San Antonio Observer in his garage nearly 30 years ago. But unlike other East Side community newspapers, nobody was really talking about politics. The San Antonio Observer took on politics and controversy with headlines like, I'm scared after a rash of police shootings on the East Side back then. Did he face any backlash as a result? Oh my God, yeah. A little setback, it's like a slingshot. We get set back, but we'll get shot forward at some time. We just have to be patient. One of their regular columnists, historian Mario Salas, says after all, they owe it to their readers. Black media creates a network uh, of people that want to know what's going on but may not pick it up anywhere else but that newspaper. I think that they know the Observer still has their back. If nobody else will, let me call the Observer. Yet long before the Observer was first published in 1995. This bus bench still says register in stylized letters, the predecessor of the San Antonio Observer. The Ali's bought the San Antonio Register first published in 1931, but no longer in circulation. Much of the focus now, the online version of the San Antonio Observer, extending its reach beyond the East Side community. You know, it's, it's designed to open everybody's minds, to give you a different perspective. 